Hello and welcome to uh, uh, another talk on, on Moffat, uh, Building in Moffat. This one's entitled, and uh, I'm Graham Roberts, and uh, the other speaker is going to be Archie McConnell. And uh, we we actually met years ago in the Archive Centre in Dumfries, where I was the archivist, and Archie was coming in researching uh, the mid steeple in Dumfries at the time. And uh, from that, he uh, moved on to sort of got his interest wetted, I think, and we moved on to the uh, to maps, and he set up the Dumfries archival mapping project. Um, and he got me involved in that and he's been getting me involved in things uh, ever since. Now, what we're going to talk about uh, today, Archie's going to concentrate on the building materials and the sources of those building materials that were used to build Moffat. Um, and I'm going to talk about the growth and change in Moffat in the period we're looking at. Uh, we'll both chip into each other's bits and cause a bit of chaos. And first of all, Archie's going to speak about mammoths. Well, of course, uh, as soon as you think of Moffat, you think of mammoths. Um, well, actually, you don't. The point of these pictures here are really to show that if you don't have the building materials that perhaps you're used to, or if you don't have any other building materials, then you go to the ones that are available. And the key to building is actually the um, having the materials that you require to be available. I know that's very basic, but uh, that's the nubbins of it. Here, uh, we have some mammoths. Uh, note actually top left, you see how big the mammoth tusk actually is. So it makes an ideal uh, framework for uh, buildings. These buildings were put together about 22,000 years ago on the Ukrainian and Russian steppes. Um, and uh, the bones and uh, tusks were gathered uh, to produce these. Um, uh, erections. And the biggest of these was around about 45 feet. So it, they're considerable in size. And the, most of the materials that we use were in fact from the mammoth, whether it be the skin or whether it be the odd bone from here and there, or indeed the tusks. So how does that play out in a Moffat scenario? Let's describe how things actually were, um, let us say, in the uh, around about 1550. The map here shows uh, Stirling Castle's uh, supplies of oak. You will notice that none of the supplies that we can see actually came from Scotland. There was indeed some that came down from. Um, uh, Darnaway up near uh, Inverness, uh, but it's not shown on this ma map, which is the third episode of building at Stirling Castle uh, in the middle of the 16th century. It shows that trade was the way that the timber was moving around. And not only was it coming from the areas shown here, the timber, um, but also from uh, the south of Norway, just to the north of all those green blobs. And the south of Norway was the main supplier to the east of Scotland. And indeed, most of the trade at that time was between Scotland and the Baltic. Um, and uh, I think we sent grain out there and we brought timber back again. Now, this wasn't particularly because we couldn't grow timber. It was just simply because this was the easiest place to get it from. You were um, loading ships of, say, um, uh, 20 to 
possibly up to 100 tons, mainly the smaller sizes, and uh, shipping things across. Now, you'll notice from the map that Dumfries and Galloway is actually the furthest point that you can get in Scotland from the supply of timber. If we go down to the right-hand side, we see how that pans out. This is Hill's Tower, built in the middle of the um, uh, 16th century, at least the right-hand half was, and it was mainly oak. The curious thing on the left-hand side is that that part, the extension, was built in 1721, and that was also oak. The framework was. Now, what we see here is an extension of the oak tradition uh, in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, when you compare it to the east coast of Scotland, uh, who had been um, basically a, a pine economy since about the 1550s. So how does that carry on? On the left here, we have the mid-steeple. Um, built uh, between 1704 and 1709. To me, the interesting part of the mid-steeple is its width. It's only 23 feet wide, and that allows you to use oak um, very happily for the structure, because it, the oak at 23 foot long, you can get uh, 8B8s, which was your normal uh, structure for the um, flooring, etc., or for the joists for the floor. And uh, the oak there um, would have been uh, grown locally. And indeed, we know the source of the oak here. It was up the Cree. Uh, and around about the 100 to 150 year old mark uh, was the time when it was uh, ready to fell. On the right hand side, we have something that was built slightly later. This is the Sanka uh, toll booth, uh, which was built in 1735. The interesting part here is we have a different width because the source of supply was totally different. Not local oak at all. Uh, but this was timber, and we know that it came from Leith because we have the uh, haulage um, uh, dockets. And uh, with those, uh, with the uh, lengths of the timber, um, it means that you can extend a much greater depth. So you're looking at around about 36 foot wide. Interestingly, both these buildings have to do with uh, people that we're going to talk about later on. On the left-hand side, the um, mid-steeple was built by a guy called um, Batchup, who was um, also involved in the building of uh, Hopeton House um, and knew all the architects of the day. And on the right-hand side, um, the building here was designed by a guy called William Adam. And the critical factor is that William Adam had also a very big builder's merchants that he used. And the builder's merchants that he used um, supplied the timber for this building. So it's all got to do with availability and sources of supply that dictate the designs of your building. Graham. Thank you, Archie. Um, well, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the origins of Moffat to start with. Uh, as you can see from this extract from uh, General Roy's military survey, which is the early 1750s, before the big changes started happening in Moffat, uh, there you can see Moffat in the centre with its classic sort of small Scottish borough, uh, wide main street uh, and fuse going left and right from that uh, the, the classic the classic layout um, it started off 
in medieval times, especially late medieval times, as a wool processing center. You can imagine a lot of sheep in the area and the wool was brought in, uh, sold, sheep were sold, and uh, and it was also processed there and, and sent on. Um, so that's where it started off. In the mid 17th century, the Johnston family started having a really big influence on the area. The Johnstons were became the uh, Earls of Allendale in the mid 17th century. They'd been uh, very powerful in upper, up, mid and upper Annandale for 200 years before that. Uh, and then they acquired a lot of lands in the early 17th century in the very upper part of Annandale, including the Moffat area. Um, in the late 1650s into the 1660s, because it needed to be confirmed, uh, they had Moffat erected as a borough of barony and regality, which gave it the power to hold fairs and markets, amongst other rights that uh, came with the uh, the creation of a borough. So that then allowed the, um, the lairds, the uh, Johnstons, to few out more lands and that started the development, but it was very slow for another hundred years or so. Um, but Moffat continued as a, an important town for wool right through the period we're going to talk about, although we're not going to talk about wool again much in the future. Uh, there was a, a big passing trade. Moffat, of course, was always well positioned on the main routes north and south. Um, and even in 1792, at the time of the first statistical account, there were 50 weavers in Moffat, wool processors, working in Moffat. And of course, the big statue on Moffat High Street is the Moffat Ram. It's nothing to do with anything else. It's the Moffat Ram. And in, also in 1792, 70 cartloads a week of cotton stuffs were passing through between Glasgow and the south. So there was also a big passing trade and that continued as well. So Moffat wasn't just a spa town, which of course is what we're going to talk about. Now, I've been asked to talk about the growth of Moffat in particular. And the rather sad news is that it didn't actually grow that much. It didn't grow uh, even in comparison with other local towns very quickly. If you look at, say, Lockerbie, which is the next town down in mid Annandale. Um, that uh, was just a very small village in the mid 18th century uh, and yet had eclipsed Moffat in population by the 1830s. Uh, if you look at another town, Langham over in Eskdale, that started off maybe about the same size as Moffat in the, uh, again, the middle of the 18th century, but by 1850, it was double the size. And Lockerbie was down to the growth in uh, agricultural processing, which is what Moffat had been doing, uh, and trade. And uh, Langham was due to manufactures with the beginning of the, the uh, woolen mills over there. Um, so Moffat didn't grow that much in population, particularly. It did grow. It, it probably doubled in size over the period we're talking about, but that was not very substantial growth for that time. Um, in extent, again, it didn't grow particularly. The, 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 the most notable growth of the three boroughs we've been talking about was in Langham, where a whole new town, New Langham, was set up by the Duke of Buccleuch in the 1760s and 70s. So Moffat was not exceptional, but Moffat's growth was unusual and possibly even for Scotland unique because Moffat became uh, Scotland's premier spa town. And it's that development that we're going to look at today in particular. And, um, and, and that's what I'm mostly going to concentrate on. So it wasn't particularly a growth in population. It wasn't a growth in extent that's notable about it. It was a growth in politeness and gentility. And uh, that's what we're going to look at. Okay, next slide, Archie. So I'll carry on first of all on this slide, and then I think Archie's going to come in a bit <coughs> later. What we're looking at here are a couple of places which have a role in Moffat's story, 
Um, top left, you can see Drum Creef. Well, Drum Creef was a, uh, a small country house that was built by a chap called Sir John Clark. Now, Clark has a big role to play in Moffat's early spa history. The spa at Moffat was, some people say discovered and some people say popularized uh, in the 1730s by a lady called Rachel Whiteford, who was the daughter of the local minister and landowner. Uh, and it become well known enough by the 1650s and 60s for uh, it to be frequented, maybe frequented is a bit strong, certainly visited occasionally uh, by the aristocracy, and it got a grant in Oliver Cromwell's time uh, to basically make the uh, the well more accessible and uh, pave around it and that kind of thing. So, so it was it was known about by then, and a couple of pu uh, publications, first of all in Latin and then in English in the late 1650s and early 1660s helped with that popularization because you always needed some sort of scientific basis for people to take the waters at the spa. That was a consistent theme for the next two or 300 years. And uh, a chap called Matthew McHale provided that for Moffat with his first book, Fons Moffatensis. So that gave it a bit of a grounding. Move on a few years, a generation or so, and you get to Sir John Clarke's time in the early 18th century. So Sir John Clarke was uh, what you might call a pre-enlightenment person. He, he was um, possibly the, the most important precursor in an as an individual of the Scottish Enlightenment that there was. And several talks could be given just about him, but I'm sadly not able to spend much time on him today, um, just to mention that he was so taken with Moffat and the well, because he had lots of local connections, and we'll come on to connections a bit later, um, that he uh, he decided to build a house here. That was Drum Creef. While Drum Creef was building, he also wanted to come and visit the well and stay in the area. And it was recommended by the provost that he stay in Frenchland Tower, and on the right hand picture, on the far right, you can just see FRE for Frenchland. It's being circled. Thank you, Archie. And, uh, and this shows two things. First of all, that people were prepared to visit Moffat, people of a high rank at that time to, to, to take the waters. Also, that accommodation in the town was very scant. And we'll come back to that definitely. Uh, but the provost was trying to recommend Frenchland to uh, Sir John Clark. And in a letter of the time, this is a quote from that from the provost's letter, uh, trying to justify Frenchland to him. All the losses you will be at is the want of the sight of Gleekry, in other words, entertainment of the town, of which I fancy you would soon store, which is get fed up with. But you will have that advantage of being free from the noise of drum, a howboy, and half a dozen of fiddlers the whole night. So that gives you a nice idea in about 1730 of what life was like in the centre of Moffat. There, was, there were things going on, uh, and th there was already a, a spa community in the season, but um, the, there wasn't the accompanying accommodation that that, that that would be needed right that's it archie next slide oh, sorry, uh, well, uh, hang on a bit yeah um, go on uh, just i'm i'm going to uh, correct you graham um oh good uh, john clark didn't build drum creef uh, there was ah, already true. a house there was already a house there and he did it up yes. um uh, as his kind of summer residence and uh the bill here that we have was actually an estimate um he had a, a um uh, who was a clerk of works shall we call him or a factor who lived in um moffat called um dixon was his name and uh they corresponded and uh, the other th magic thing about john clark is he kept all his letters 
It seemed to be a fashion in those days, people just hanging on to them. And so we've got these extraordinary letters about, um, going backwards and forwards from this guy Dixon to him. And this is one of them about extending uh, or replacing the um, thatch on the back lean-to of the house, which was the kitchen area, and uh, wanting to slate it. And uh, just to run down the list here, we have uh, slate here, um, and it's winning. You've got to win the slate. So uh, what that means is that you've got to dig it out of the ground and actually make each individual slate. So thus the price there. Now, this is probably from uh, the slate quarry up uh, in Crawford Parish, and so a little way away, um, but uh, very much still local. Um, the slate eventually was um, uh, denounced as being really not up to scratch at all, and uh, he um, and it was uh, later disused for. I mean, uh, not used anymore because uh, the imports were of so much better quality. Um, and uh, yeah, Lancashire slate essentially comes in vogue uh, fairly soon after this. Um, uh, moving down, we've got uh, 30 uh, fur deals. It's called a dale here, but it's a, it's a, we normally call it a deal, uh, which will be, and when it says fur, it actually means pine. Um, so planks of pine. These will have been around about 10 to 12 inches wide, uh, maybe an inch and a half to uh, two inches fat, and uh, maybe up to um, uh, 12 foot or something of that nature um, in, in length. They weren't terribly long. Uh, but what it was was just producing the battens, if you like, to... Um, or they're calling them laths, uh, to hang the slates on. Um, so these fur dales needed to be sawed. So you have the, um, the, the next part of it here is sawing the dales. Um, these uh, fur deals, of course, would have been imported and would have been uh, sent down from uh, Leith. Uh, there are other letters of his that also um, talk about shipping timber in from um, from Leith um, and, in fact, from Dumfries for um, thinner materials as well. It just depended on, if I may use the term, uh, what was available at the time. Um, an item for um, Mason and three days' work. Two loads of lime. A load is notionally a ton, so that's a, a, a fair uh, lump of lime. Um, uh, it's a cartful, so two cartfuls of lime is what they're talking about. Um, nails. Uh, they would have um, uh, eight hundred seems awfully few, uh, but maybe they were just nailing the laths onto the um, spars. Uh, or uh, perhaps they were um, uh, and using um, pegs through the um, slate, which would have just been uh, taken out of the uh, back ends of the um, uh, of the fur deals. Um, the last item I find particularly interesting is laying the spars. Uh, the right work, that's the um, joinery work for laying the spars. I find this particularly interesting because there's no item for the price of the spars. Now, the spars would have been what we would call the joists or the um, rafters, in effect, on this particular roof, um, onto which you would uh, lay the laths. Now, if it's a spar, it indicates to me that that's probably going to be roundwood. If it's roundwood, it's probably being uh, local materials that are being used. So perhaps even uh, ash, maybe even birch, all sorts of different things might have been used for that, depending on the length required. 
there is also the possibility that some um, thin bars were used from the uh, new, um, uh, what do you call them, uh, conifer plantations that were being planted at the time um, and a little bit before this. Uh, we're starting to find um, specifically pine being planted around about the uh, turn of the century in Dumfries and Galloway. So uh, between the 1690s and 1610s, we're getting certainly initial indications of, of plantations. And I would think that that would be the case uh, in Annandale at the time. Um, we shall talk about uh, lime a little further, um, but uh, let's um, uh, go on. Oh, incidentally, Clark also uh, ordered up amongst other things, uh, Scots pine, and um, also some gooseberry bushes for his garden, just incidentally. Okay, uh, this is um, uh, what I refer to as Nieves House, but is the Archbald Moffat House uh, down the main drag in Moffat. The interesting thing of this house is that it is using by far the most of local materials uh, to do the job here. Stone, as most people have noticed in Dumfries and Galloway who have taken a shovel to the land, um, is very readily available. Um, so it's never really, uh, to me anyway, it's not really very interesting at this time as to where the stone came from because likely as not, it was just from the fields and not even from a quarry. What the stone is stuck together with, on the other hand, is of interest because it's stuck together with uh, essentially clay mud or fail. And it's one of the few houses, I think, in Moffat, if not the only house in Moffat, that is still inhabited and that was constructed this way. Uh, the date for it is 1751. So we're just about to talk about the changeover times. And we have, like those two public buildings that I was talking about earlier, we have the, um, the crux, if you like, or the point of change uh, using this house and uh, then the others that we'll see later on, where the materials did a complete change around um, and uh, we get more import and less um, local materials used. On the left-hand side, we can see a piece of pine, um, nicely wormy, but I think that's just because of a wee bit of damp at one time. Um, and it's uh, a lintel. Now, uh, the sources of the timber in this particular house, I think, may have been both imported and also locals, local supplies. I saw uh, at one time uh, with Niev uh, some six per sixes uh, that were used as lintels. And the interesting part was all four sides had been hewn, um, so not cut with a saw. Now that would indicate to me that it wasn't imported at all, but came from locally grown conifers. As, we, as we've discussed, uh, this uh, conifer plantations uh, would have started in the early 18th, 18th century. And the number of rings on these uh, squares, because the um, uh, the center of the tree, the pith of the tree was showing in the middle. And so there were all concentric rings that you could see on the um, end of these um, uh, bits of lintel, uh, indicated between 20 and 25 years old. And that would tie in very nicely to the plantations that were being made at the time um, in uh, Upper Annandale. Um, right, if we talk a little bit more about the stonework, uh, and here we can see the, the kind of, um, how do you put it, the quality of the mud. Um, but 
it does crumble, especially when it's opened up to the weather. The interesting part to me is the thickness of the walls. And on the left there, uh, we have uh, it's upstairs and it's uh, where uh, the gable end started to uh, crumble a bit, not because of the weather, but because somebody had attached a TV aerial to the top um, and the um, chimney as well. And the vibrations from that had cracked up the stonework um, and stonework that had stood for, what, 250 plus years um, and uh, attach a TV aerial and it starts to crumble, which I find um, uh, <laughs> interesting. But it, the vibrations obviously caused in the wind um, uh, essentially shook things uh, to bits. I did say we would talk briefly about uh, Lyme as well, but this is a specific um, thing that uh, we have talked about in um, uh, the DAMP, that's the Dumfries Archival Mapping Project uh, meetings before. Um, uh, which is uh, lime taken from seashells. Uh, this show, this is a picture by Peter Norman, and uh, I was intrigued by it because here is actually a seashell uh, within, encased in the lime uh, on a building. Um, it's actually up the Skyer Glen by. Uh, um, gatehouse of fleet. I had always thought that um, lime from shells was used principally as agricultural lime, um, but here we see it in the mortar as well. And down at the bottom, uh, we see them collecting the shell from the shell bank um, in uh, Ross Bay, just to the south of Kukubri. Um, and it was something that went on for uh, many years in that neck of the woods. And also, um, there were one or two other known shell banks, like there was one near a Cretan at Cass and Carry, um, along the Solway. And uh, I think I'm handing over to you, Graham. Very kind of you. Um... This is the first of quite a few estate plans we're going to look at uh, during the course of the rest of this talk. Um, DAMP, as Archie just uh, mentioned, uh, is all about maps and specifically pre-ordnance survey maps. And Moffat, there's a wealth of pre-ordnance survey maps for, for Moffat, which is one of the reasons why we can learn so much about its growth and change and uh, this one is a general view plan of the 15 Merkland and town of Moffat uh, dating from pretty well the beginning of the improvement period uh, in the 1760s and it uh, shows Moffat roughly in the centre there sorry 1758 this is 1758 a thank you Archie 1758 uh, and the all the yellow bits shown on the map are those areas of land owned by the Marquis of Annandale. Um, I mentioned the Earls of Annandale, they were upgraded to Marquises in uh, 1701. So by this time, it's the Marquis that owned a large part of the land in and around Moffat. Um, and that will do for that. Next slide. Uh, right. Well, this was, as far as we know, the very first plan that was made uh, once it was decided to make big changes to Moffat. It's not very clear. It's been a little damaged and uh, we're going to use uh, some later images uh, of tracings to um, explain it better. But this is the plan by James Tate from 1758, as Archie's just mentioned. Uh, when the improvements were started. Now, it was John Hope, the second Earl of Hopeton, who instigated these changes. And he was, he basically taken over as curator bonus for the Marquis 
because the Marquis was mentally incapable. And the uh, the Earl, John, he um, sketched out in the 1750s a, a series of uh, plans, uh, a scheme of improvement for changing the estate. And this came to fruition in 1758. Uh, the very first things he wanted to do were get detailed plans made of the town and the area around and commissioned James Tate and uh, other later surveyors as well to carry out uh, all this survey work. Um, it's interesting to note that there were lots of other schemes of improvement about at the time, but especially the bigger landowners. And the very same year as uh, John Hope, the Earl of Hopeton, was, uh, had promulgated this scheme. Um, there was also the Earl of Nithsdale's scheme of improvement. And they were two very different things. The Earl of Nithsdale basically had no money to do anything, and the scheme admitted it, and uh, changes were consequently quite slow, um, if not piecemeal. Whereas in Moffat, things started pretty well straight away in, in quite a, a, a big way. That's not looking at the agricultural side, which the, the, is not something for this talk. We'll, we'll concentrate on the town. Um, so in 1760, uh, the Earl put forward a private bill to few 100 acres of the 10 pound land of Moffat, which is the immediate center of Moffat. And this explains what what he wanted to do and why he wanted to do it and also is the explanation if you like for a lot of the changes in Moffat over the next hundred years and this is the quote and whereas the town of Moffat part of the said 10 pound land of Moffat is greatly resorted to by persons of persons of all ranks and conditions for the benefit of using the mineral water in the neighborhood of the said town but the said company has been hitherto very ill accommodated by reasons of the badness and poorness of the houses and other buildings in the said town and by the want of many other necessary conveniences. And whereas many of the houses in the said towns of Moffat and Annan belong in property to the said Marquis, which are all of them very poor and mean and fallen into such disrepair and decay that many of them are already ruinous and most of them must soon be so if not rebuilt, which would occasion, occasion a very great charge and expense. So in other words, he's looking for funds with which to carry out his plans. And fewing out lands was one of the main ways he was going to do it. So that's it for that one for me, Archie. Well, this is just a uh, probably a late 19th century photo showing the setting of Moffat. And we're now looking at the spa in a bit more detail. And um, one of the uh, criteria for a spa, for, for making a successful spa, um, there were several criteria drawn up, drawn up by one of the spa historians in fairly recent years, John Stobart. And he said a pleasant environment is one of them. Well, this is the pleasant environment, or we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides time. The other ones were cleanliness and regular buildings, social institutions and good company. Well, arguably, in fact, definitely, Moffat already had the good company bit. It just didn't have anywhere to put people that was appropriate and uh, a very limited scope of things for them to do once they were there. So that, that was the problem that the, uh, the Earl was trying to correct. Uh, next. And this is the other side of it. Uh, also in 1758, a chap called Dr. James, John Hunter was granted a lease of Clarefoot and Arch Bank, which is the the big image that's all those lands and uh sort of center lower left uh is the well of uh moffat on the lands of arch bank uh just near where they that's the there and um 
That's right. Learn to Arch Bank. Thank you very much, Archie. You're, you're on it. Um, and the uh, so in 1758, Hunter got the lease and immediately started building uh, an assembly room. He called it the long room. And this is one of the facilities that every spa had to have. So he built the long room, but the long room's building was funded by the Earl of Hopeton, strangely, and he and Hunter basically had to pay him back over many years with the income that he received. A little bit later on in 1769, he also had a road built to the well because it was it was a mile out of the village uh, or the town and it was not the easiest mile. So he had a new road built, which is, uh, you can see on the bottom left image, uh, the new road follows the line closely of the uh, of the the river, and, um, and and the old road, which is a bit hillier, um, runs to the south of it. Uh, so that was a, another big thing, and at the same time, a bridge was built over the stream so you could get to the well more easily. So th these were very important improvements. By the later part of the century, the well was becoming a lot more widely used and uh, a visitor to the town described the types of people who used the well as the rheumatic, the scrofulous and the hypochondriac or idle. And he said that this latter class are the most numerous and he called them a useful tribe with whom all waters agree. In other words, they're just coming along for the ride have a have a have a good time, and uh, if they take waters at all, it doesn't matter. It's not going to it's not going to bother them. They don't need it for their health. So that was the kind of visitor that Moffat was tending to attract by the later part of the century. In the earlier period, uh, most people were coming for medicinal reasons. Okay. Um, well, I just want to add one or two yeah. things to that. Um, uh, we've talked about William Adam briefly and how he also had a builder's merchants. Um, and uh, uh, although he was primarily an architect and these maps are done by a guy called Joseph Udney, uh, who was obviously a surveyor, but he also had, um, uh, he was a nurseryman and uh, had lots of hedging plants, which is useful if you're a surveyor and telling people to put in various forms of fencing. Uh, he also sold um, uh, sundials as well. So essentially, it was a sort of a, a garden center that he had, uh, one in Moffat, one in Dumfries, and uh, one or two elsewhere as well. Uh, and Dr. Hunter, who you mentioned, Graham, um, mm -hmm. he, he had the ballroom, but he also advised folk to drink goat's milk and uh, because yes. he kept a herd of goats, which, you know, that would be a good thing to suggest to people to drink, I would imagine. Yes. Um, For some reason, I think it was the way that they, they were supposed to drink, oh, which doesn't all... sound quite so entertaining, but still. No, it, it sounds disgusting anyway, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm only getting to grips with goat's cheese just now. So, um, yeah, goat's cheese milk. Cheese is fine. Yeah, cheese is fine. Um, right, next slide. Well, this is the, um, the Gallow Hill Plantation just above Moffat. And I was talking about the pleasant environment uh, that um, spas needed around them. And this is one of the moves that was made in the early days to create that by creating promenades and walks in the hill just above Moffat in the new plantation there, um, which... Uh, was in in itself a, a reasonably big undertaking. You can see that all the all the paths are, are wiggly and therefore much more picturesque than straight straight ones would have been. Uh, it it also shows too that the the, um, uh, the initial plans were rather greater than the uh, eventual um, outcome. Which, uh, yes. if you look at the number of number of pathways. Um, on the left-hand side in comparison, which was a, a, um, a James Tate map, um, uh, compared to the Udney version here um, yeah. on the right-hand side, um, uh, it begins to get a little bit more pragmatic, shall we say. Fair right. enough. 
Well, I mentioned earlier on that we were going to uh, look at Tate's plan uh, of the centre of Moffat, which which is almost illegible, uh, in a later um, copy. Um, this isn't actually Tate. It's a map of about 1780, but uh, we'll come across one of a, a bit of Tate later on. So this is the, the centre of Moffat um, from around about 1780 in, in a tracing. Uh, and it, it shows that the changes that were going on in the town at the time. If we look at the next slide, this is a close up of the south end of the high street. And there you can see some dates on some of the uh, properties on the left in particular, John Shorts, William Carruthers, 1771. These were the dates that the fuse were given, that the fuse that were mentioned in that 1760 document, they were being taken up uh throughout the period we're talking about from 1760 onwards not that quickly but they, they were taken up and and there's uh there's a few marked on this map so in other words new building was happening and improvements were being made i think you had something on this one as well archie yep uh, the on the right hand side at the top there you can see the factor's house now the factor generally speaking for allendale um lived uh further south in more boreal climes, presumably. And one of the reasons that he was moved up here was because of the lawlessness of Moffat people, um, specifically um, because they were nicking the timber, as we've mentioned before. Uh, so uh, the um, stealing of timber uh, is uh, one of the reasons that the um, factor was moved here. Fine. Now, I think this slide is particularly interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, the left, the lower left image um, is a copy of Tate's 1758 plan. We can't show the whole thing, or at least it's not uh, useful to show the whole thing because you can't see the detail. and It's all written in different ways and directions, so it's hard to work it out. But this little center section of it is really useful in the middle you can see the bowling green which i'll come back to on the left hand side you can see lots of little dwellings all at different angles haphazard and the this is on the main street of moffat and the, they were still there in 1758 and, and the ones on the right where it says boyd's upside down all that lot will be of the same kind very small cottages and an early traveler uh, in the early 18th century through Moffat, described Moffat as a knot of hovels, which is a sort of notorious um, comment, uh, or became notorious. And uh, this is the kind of building he was probably referring to. And these buildings were all swept away in those 20 years. And when you look at the top right image, there's not a single one left. We've got at the top right, top left rather of the top right image, uh, Moffat House, which we'll come back to, and we'll both mention a bit more about that, that was uh, built in the 1760s. Uh, and then on the right, bottom right, you can see Dr. Hunter's few. Well, that's the same Dr. Hunter we've been talking about, the Dr. Hunter of the well. He also took a large few in the centre of town and demolished all the existing houses on it and built some new ones. So this was all happening. Uh, during those 20 years. And also, going back to the Bowling Green. Now, the Bowling Green does not date from the improvement period. You can see it's there in the 1758 map. It dates from 1722 and was an attempt by one of the earlier marquises to uh, encourage the use of Moffat as a spa. Uh, and it was built with public subscription, so there was quite a lot of interest in it. Now, this bowling green is one of those facilities that's referred to uh, by Stobart as, as uh, one of the criteria of a, a of a borough and in a very good uh, of a spa. And in a very good article by Catherine Glover about ten years ago, uh, she notes that the bowling green was the focal point of daytime activities in in the spa. That's where people went to, to have a chat, uh, to um, 
meet up for even possibly romantic assignations because um, Robert Adam, uh, we've talked about William Adam, one of his sons, Robert, uh, the famous architect, of course, he uh, wrote a series of letters in 1755 to his sister, Peggy, who was staying in the Moffat at the time, uh, and uh, said, I expect you'll be, I'm paraphrasing here, I expect you'll be uh, promenading on the Bowling Green and meeting all sorts of fine fellows. And he was trying to encourage her to basically make a good match and also to raise the social standing of the Adam family, which he felt was too low. This was a, a very strong theme of those letters, all very interesting stuff. This is what one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that many people came to the town in a less formal setting than you'd say find in Edinburgh uh, to, um, to be able to meet up with different superior, in particular, ranks of people and get to know them and make uh, contacts which could be used later. So that was a, also on the Bowling Green, as an example, um, in the uh, late 1750s, Dr. Alexander Carlyle, who was one of the uh, leading lights of the uh, churchman, one of the leading lights of the um, Enlightenment, uh, knew everybody there was to know, but he met up with James Macpherson. And James Macpherson was the, became the author of Ossian. And my, one of my only props for today is uh, this book. The, uh, this is the second volume of the works of Ossian uh, by Macpherson. Uh, in published in 1765. This is the third edition. It actually came out in 62. And uh, apparently in a talk with Alexander Carlyle, it was that talk on uh, Gallic epic poetry that inspired him to start writing Ossian. Of course, he claimed he didn't write it and there was a big controversy which uh, went on for many years afterwards. Um, but he claimed it was original stuff that he was translating. Uh, but that could have started in that Bowling Green at Moffat, an example of the kind of things that, that could go on. Okay. Aha. Okay. Um, now, uh, we were talking about Niev's house, the Archibald Moffat house, which was all local materials. And suddenly, with the um, change around uh, with um, John Hope sorting things out, uh, we have different buildings uh, coming into play. In, uh, I think it was around about uh, 17... Uh, 58, 59, um, a Mr. Hogan gets asked to find supplies of stone um, locally, um, i.e. to find quarries. And uh, I think the same Mr. Hogan actually later becomes a factor for Alan Annandale. Yeah. Um, but main quarries were, um, the early on ones anyway, were up at, at the common Craig. Um, which is just to the north of uh, Moffat and the Well Hill, uh, but also there was the, the Garden Home Quarry to the south. And this, in fact, closed, I think, somewhere between the wars. So it lasted really quite a long time. Uh, there was also uh, the other quarry for sandstone that became big around this neck of the woods was the Corn, Co Corn Cockle Quarry uh, just further to the south. But so building materials are now being quarried. They're not just being lifted off a field. Um, and uh, we're looking at uh, volumes of stone obviously being uh, required for these buildings. Now, both of these buildings, the Moffat House and the King's Arms, now known as the Annandale Arms, uh, were started in 1762. And both of them pretty much took about five years to build. And I think, and I may be entirely wrong, that they illustrate one of the reasons that uh, Moffat uh, never became actually a boom town. And that was because of lack of builders or uh, a lack of um, regular builders that you could um, uh, uh, 
use on a day-to-day -day basis. The King's Arms was the first that was started, and they paid the standard Moffat rate of eight pence um, per day um, for uh, each laboring builder. At Moffat House was nine pence per day. And sure enough, things ground to a halt um, in the King's Arms. Now, Moffat House was actually designed um, by William Adam's son, John Adam. So that's, uh, you were talking uh, about, uh, yeah, he's, a, he's one of the siblings of uh, Robert and Peggy, who you were talking about, um, yeah. uh, Graham. And so you have your direct supply lines uh, to the Leith docks, and then from there on to the Baltic and to Norway. Um, and so we have uh, wider, bigger buildings, uh, more substantial rooms and uh, a different type of feel altogether from the rather, uh, if you'll excuse me, Niev, uh, pokey um, uh, <laughs> building um, uh, of the Archibald Moffat House. Um, now, the other interesting part in the King's Arms is that also there was some brick used um, but it wasn't kind of brick as we know it but very much just used as partition walls um, or for partition walls and was just uh, clay and um, uh, what you call the stuff straw uh, banged together and uh, it was yeah a fairly dodgy kind of um, thing and the um, this was also happening in another inn that was um, in Moffat at the time, at the Spur Inn. And uh, they were also mixing clay and straw. And uh, in fact, they also uh, just put formers in and s smashed, if you like, or trod down the clay in between the formers. Um, the search for quarries, um, Hogan's search for quarries, was also tied uh, to the fuse, uh, which would have to allow people to come and uh, dig on their um, uh, land. Um, also, uh, we see that lime mortar is now needing to be used rather than um, a fail. And, uh, Essentially, this was also tied into the fuse as well. Uh, and I think also slate was. Uh, so the transition, if you like, has been uh, complete. Um, you've got a reorganization of the fuse so that it actually stipulates the building materials that are now being used in Moffat. And you can't just uh, build whatever it is you like. We're trying to make this place look nice and uh, feel nice okay yes yeah, so i'll just follow up and say on that one uh, actually those are the two main those two buildings are the two main statements in stone of the move towards a polite town um again trying to create moffat as as, as more of a spa but there were other buildings built around that time which um greatly changed the townscape the town hall in 1772, new manse about the same time, and the new church uh, in 1790. Um, now, shall I go ahead on this one, Archie? Yep, go for it. Yeah, fine. This is a, a small section of a large roads plan. Now, we haven't talked about uh, roads yet and infrastructure generally, but it was extremely important. Um, I'm sorry, Graham. I'm going. I'm going to interrupt. This one. This one isn't that one. Oh, it's not. I'm on the wrong one. No. Yeah. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Uh, this is the, the the roads come in a little bit. Yes. This is the, a close up of the um, Udney plan of about 1780, just showing the centre of Moffat. Yeah. And it uh, and it shows 
how the town has spread a little bit in, in extent since the 1750s, but not very much. On Eastgate Street, you can see some development, which is just to the um, the right hand side and the, the south of the of the main street. Well, it's not actually the south, it's the the that, that's it just there. Um, that's that's Eastgate Street. And also, and a little bit more obviously on the well road to the south of that. Uh, that's it there. So uh, we, we've there's been some sporadic development, but but not not very much. Although by 1787, the Gentleman's Magazine was able to say that Moffat was one of the best built and cleanest villages in Scotland. So there's been a big change. Okay. And this viewing plan ties up to uh, the previous map because it shows some of these uh, views along the New Well Road, which uh, we just pointed out. And the first one that we can see that was taken up was on the left hand side, John Finlayson's of 1772. So those houses would most have mostly have probably been complete by around about 1780 something. Uh, and expansion continued towards the well along the well road from then, but slowly. Uh, okay. This is actually the roads plan that I was mentioning earlier. This is the, uh, this dates from a little bit after 1800 probably, and uh, gives a good idea of Moffat again, having grown a little bit more, a bit more extensive than it was. But, but more importantly, as I was gonna say, is the infrastructure and uh, the role of that in the, in the growth of Moffat. Um, to quote uh, Major Prevost, who's one of Moffat's historians, he says, there's no doubt that the setting up of the mail coach system, which by the way was in the mid 1780s onwards, and the construction of good turnpike roads, which both predated and postdated that, um, were factors which contributed more than anything else to the growth and prosperity of Moffat. Well, I'd probably argue a bit with that, but there's there's no doubt that its position, its geographical position, and its once the connections were made, its ease of access from Edinburgh, Glasgow, and even England were greatly improved. And of course, Dumfries in the West as well. So, uh, and if we look at the next slide, that's a little bit of the new road being surveyed uh, north of Moffat, the road to Edinburgh, uh, and the old road is at the top where old, ha old House Hill is. It's about two, two and a half miles north of Moffat. And the south is the new road, which um, became the uh, beef tub later on, the beef tub road, the modern A701. Uh, just a, a, a little um, bit on that, just to give you an idea of um, how the transport was eased. When, uh, I've forgotten his name now, the the Colossus of Rhodes. Oh, Telford. Uh, when, when Telford put his road through here in the uh, um, 1820s, um, it was a, a big, big change uh, to what had been there before yeah. and uh, the when it was proposed to parliament and what he was actually going to do uh, the estimate was that it would decrease the traveling time by five hours between glasgow and carlisle huh. eat your heart uh, out hs2 well exactly um so uh, <laughs> You know, five, five hours, you know, these days seems an enormous amount of time. But think how the, that would have saved on um, uh, transport and not just for of people, but also of uh, building materials and such like uh, before, yeah, of course, exactly. the railway came. Yeah, yeah, that Carlisle to Glasgow Road was a massive change and uh, was probably the last big change before the coming of the railways, which is we'll come on to in a minute. like now, for instance. Uh, so this is the first Ordnance Survey map uh, at a large scale of Moffat, 25 inches to the mile. 
um, and this dates from 1857. And it shows a big, big difference in the extent of Moffat uh, between the last map of just after 1800 and this one. Uh, for a start, you can see to the north, go following up the high street to the north, there's new developments all the way along Beach Grove. Uh, that's some early 19th century small villas and they became bigger villas further out uh, to the due north of Moffat, just a little bit to the right of that. Uh, you've got Larchfield Cottage and Larchfield was built in 1807. And that was the first really of the big villas that Moffat became is now really known for better than its other architecture. Uh, and those villas spread out in all directions from Moffat and on this map you can see going along the uh, the well road the old the new well road uh, following out the fuse a whole load of villas have been built out there right up towards the well um, the first ones were built around the 1820s and we'll have a look at one of those in a minute but that later that that, that one there for instance Sidmont the the later ones um, following up towards the well were built around the time of the coming of the railway to Beatuk in 1847. Uh, and a lot of the ground between the uh, new well road, that one, and the old well road where Larch Field is, was built up uh, after, the, after the coming of the railway and especially about the time of the branch line to Moffat in the early 1880s. So there, there were a lot of big changes happened there. Um, but it was villa architecture that drove the expansion of Moffat um, in, uh, in the mid-19th century in particular. Well, yes, when you've got uh, railways, it means you can get um, anything from anywhere, basically. Um, so uh, no longer is local supply really rated. You've got to have things coming from quite often miles away to make it look snazzy as it were yeah yeah right and here we go snazzy snazzy well this is quite snazzy um so we were talk we've been talking a bit about uh, facilities and i'm now looking at the early 19th century moffat's facilities as a spa were still pretty limited in this period you still had to go up to the well if you wanted to uh, take the waters on in situ um, and the assembly rooms were up there but in 1827 um, uh, this building was designed this is the Moffat Baths designed by Walter Newell um, easily the most accomplished architect Dumfries and Galloway's ever produced uh, and uh, also very prolific and um, but and this is one of his uh, a classic, uh, well, classic neoclassical building um, to, to house the uh, uh, the baths and an assembly room. The baths are at the back, the assembly room at the front, and then also at this, just after this time, or just before it, I think the bowling green was moved from the centre of the street round to the back of this new building. Um, so uh, these these sorts of uh, changes help to bring keep Moffat up to speed with the times. Um, and, and the, wa the water was uh, brought in a pipe all the way from the well? It was it? piped from the well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and around this time in 1822, a um, uh, chap called Wade produced a, uh, a guide to um, Scottish wells and he called Moffat the Scottish Cheltenham. So, uh, so his architecture, Cheltenham's mostly famous for its um, Regency architecture. So you can see that Moffat's architecture was, uh, in his opinion, living up to that sort of standard. Don't know if it was really. Good stuff. And this is Sidmont that we were talking about earlier, a, a delightful yeah. house that Archie's going to talk a little bit about in a minute, I think. 1832 to 6, one of the... Uh, grandest of the uh, Moffat villas, notable, of course, for being single story, a sort of uh, Indian bungalow and strangely built for a returning Indian nabob. And this actually, 
this trend to wealthy people either having a summer house in Moffat or retiring to Moffat uh, was one of the big movers in the in the building of villas. The other one was the villas were used as uh, guest accommodation for summer visitors. So it was a mixture of the two, really. Um, Aren't you? Yeah, I, I find this an extraordinary building altogether. The the footprint of this one is is larger than the uh, footprint of uh, Moffat House, for instance. So yeah. you're you're talking, um, you know, fairly substantial kind of a beast. Um, but if you think about all the rules that uh, we've been talking about, I'll put rules in inverted commas, but um, about building widths, how you're building to um, uh, the lengths of timber that you have available, et cetera, et cetera. It's all gone out. It's all gone out the window. And suddenly you've got this really peculiar thing uh, coming into Moffat, which is sort of 45, 50 foot across, um, which is essentially enormous. Um, uh, and uh, you don't see the kind of the um how do you put it palladian proportions of the adams family um they've disappeared as well and we're now getting uh walter newell uh just uh well for goodness sakes he did all sorts of peculiar things it, you know he was he, incredibly adaptable versatile yeah yeah i mean there was there's that jacobean house in in moffat which is most extraordinary and then you've got this one just along the road um, so there's uh, all sorts of things that um, uh, that Newell got up to, but he was allowed to do it because he had, by the 1830s, free range of the materials that he required to do things with. Um, so he wasn't he um, could manage with what um, was available at the time. Um, so yeah. Basically, uh, the other part of that equation is, of course, that wealth could do um, tricks um, now that the um, railways had arrived, um, just simply because materials were uh, much more readily available. Although, having said that, the railway hasn't quite arrived at this time, uh, but the wealth of this nabob was uh, sufficient to give you whatever it was that you were looking for and carriage along the roads would have been easier than it used to be as well wouldn't it? Oh, oh yes yeah um, yeah all all that kind of stuff um but uh yeah railways really did make a, a big big difference though in terms of uh shipping building materials around but mm -hmm. we're still looking for at fairly local sandstone being used here um we're looking at um uh I don't know whether it was Locker Briggs or Concockle Sandstone, um, but it's um, uh, certainly relatively local. Uh, but you have the um, the wrought iron veranda um, along the garden side that you can see at the top there, uh, mm -hmm. which would have come in from, uh, I presume, Glasgow or somewhere, yeah. um, uh, probably further afield. Although having said that, uh, um, uh, there was a, a, a casting um, uh, place in Dumfries as well, but there was a foundry, yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a foundry there, yeah. So uh, who knows? Okay, we'll go on, and Graham. Yeah, th thanks, Archie. Well, this is our last slide again, showing the pleasant environment around. Um, uh, Moffat, and I just want to bring the talk back to the uh, the three towns I mentioned at the start: Moffat, Langham, and Lockerbie. All three of them were created police boroughs in the 1850s and had sort of uh, achieved a municipal status formally by then. Um, but they'd done it in very different ways: um, Langham through manufacturing, Lockerbie agricultural processing and trade and Moffat primarily through being a spa. And uh, it's just interesting to speculate um, what the Earl of Hopeton, who planned the whole thing out in the 1750s, would have thought now of the 
tour buses on the high street on a busy Sunday in August in Moffat. Uh, he'd have probably been quite pleased, I would have thought. Thank you.